Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for attending uh, my training session about the management plan and about dmptour.org. Um, my name is Song Yao Chen, and I am the data science librarian at Cook Library. Uh, so let's begin. Okay, um, so this is uh, my contact information, as I said. My name is uh, Song Yao Chen, and I'm the data science librarian at Cook Library. And here's my contact information, um, my email address, and my phone. But uh, I personally prefer to be contacted uh, via my email address so we can talk more about uh, the appointment schedule uh, and your concern about uh, your data management plan, your research project, etc. So if you have any questions or if you um, need any of my service or any kind of a con uh, request, feel free to shoot me an email or you can just uh, call me to make appointment. Uh, we, I am more than happy to conduct this um, kind of a consultation or um, conversation with you. So, so this is the uh, agenda of my presentation today. First of all, I'm going to talk about data management plan, which can be um see, can be seen as uh, DMP um, or DMSP. Um, first, I'm going to talk about some kind of a general guidance regarding the data management plan preparation. Actually, this guidance is uh, some kind of a uh, um, concern some 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 kind of uh, consideration when you're preparing the data management and in extent extending to considering some important factors of your research project when we are preparing our data management plan and I'm going to use the DMP, uh, the latest uh, DMPS, uh, DMSP policy released by NIH as one, as the example, uh, try to tell you about um, how the funders require um, the applications, uh, the uh, DM, DMSP sections in the grant applications. And, and then I'm going to talk briefly about how to use that dmptool.org, which is, uh, I think, is a very good tool for you to prepare um, your data management plan for, according to different funders, because dmptool.org actually provide a wide scope uh, and covering a wide scope of funders requirement in the, uh, in the section of data management plan. <laughs> And finally, I'm going to introduce a little bit about the current research data services provided by Cook Library that is provided by me about the data management plan, about the data analysis and data visualization, and something about the data repository and sharing, etc. And just a little bit about our space, we call it Data Studio, located on the second floor of our library, uh, in which five workstations can be used by faculty and the students with a lot of data-related applications installed, etc. So um, let's begin. So uh, first of all, what is data management plan? What is a data management plan? A data management plan is a formal document that outlines what you will do with your data during and after a research project. Most researchers collect, collect data with some form of plan in mind, but it's often inadequately documented and incompletely throughout. Many data management issues can be handled easily or avoided entirely by planning ahead. With the right process and the framework, it doesn't take too long and can pay off enormously in the long run. Um, in February of 2013, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is OSTP, issued uh, a memorandum directing federal agencies that provide significant research funding to develop a plan to expand public access to research 
Among other requirements, the plans must, I quote, ensure that all extramural researchers receiving federal grants and contracts for scientific research and uh, intramural researchers develop data management plans as appropriate describing how they will provide for long-term preservation of and access to scientific data in digital formats resulting from federally funded research or explaining why long-term preservation and access cannot be justified. And actually, most U.S. federal funded grants and many private foundations require some form of a data management plan. In the United States, most of the data management plans are two page, just two pages documents submitted as part of the funding proposal process. Well, actually, in practice, using dmptool.org to create a data management plan typically will more than two pages because uh, in the default, the format uh, of uh, this created uh, document will be a larger spaces. So by adjusting the formats of the data management uh, data management plan, you can easily adjust it into the two pages. Well, actually, that is not some kind of a hard regulation that you have to follow. But actually, um, like I just mentioned, it's it, it's just some kind of a small section in your big grant proposal. So, like, who requires a plan? It. Uh, it actually, first of all, like I said, it is a required section of the grant proposals, and it's required by most of the funders like NIH, NSF, DOJ, etc. Uh, federal federal uh, funders or some kind of uh, private fund foundations, etc. The link on my presentation, all the links in my presentation file can be clicked, and I will share this file to you all. Uh, afterwards, and you feel free to click it because I have included a lot of, I think, useful information into the links. So I use, I um, I would like to use uh, the requirement format of data management plan required by NSF generic uh, grant proposal as an example to tell you that in general, um, for NSF generic grant proposal, the a data management plan should include number one, data types, number two, data standards, number three, data access, number four, data sharing, and number five, data preservation. And <clears throat> to elaborate this five point is uh, for the data types, it's like it refers to the types of data, examples, physical collection, software, curriculum materials and other materials to be produced in the course of the project. And for for data standards refers to it refers to the standards to be used for data and metadata format and content where existing standards are absent or deemed inadequate. This should be documented along with any proposed solutions or remedies. And for data access, it refers to the policies for access and sharing, including provisions for appropriate protection of privacy, confidentiality, security, intellectual property, or other rights or requirements. And for data sharing, it refers to the policies and provisions for reuse, redistribution, and the production of derivatives and number five, uh, for data preservation, it refers to the plans for archiving data examples and other research products and for preservation of access to them. So <clears throat> I'm going to uh, talk about the general guidance of uh, planning the data management for a uh, research project etc. in general. And all of the, the information that I'm going to, to, to talk about can be found on the website of dmptour.org through the link I put on the bottom of, of this page. 
feel free to click it afterwards to uh, review all of the information. So the agenda of this general guidance uh, it, it's, it, it's like this. First, uh, the types of data, and the second, the file formats. The third, organize, organizing files, and the metadata is about the, the data documentation, and persistent identifiers, and then security and storage, and then sharing and archiving, and then citing data. The last one is copyright and privacy. Those are the points that we recommend you to consider when you are planning not only the section of data management plan, but also the whole research project data management. So it's not only planning this section in the grant proposal, but also the whole, like, like how you manage the data produced or created in this uh, research project. Yeah. So first of all, <clears throat> types, of, types of data. Um, it is recommended actually to categorize your data in four ways, by source, by format, by stability and volume. And I'm going to talk about it one by one. So first of all, by source, um, although data comes from many different sources, actually they can be grouped into four main categories. The categories your data comes from will affect the choices that you make throughout your data management plan. So I have listed these four main categories of uh, the source by source. The, the, the type of data by source, first of all, is observational. It's uh, This kind of data is captured in real time, typically outside in the lab, and usually irreplaceable and therefore the most important to safeguard. Examples are like sensor readings, telemetry, survey results, image, etc. And the second one, we call it experimental. So this type of data typically generated in the in the lab or under controlled conditions and uh, often reproducible but can be expensive or time consuming. The examples include uh, the gene sequences, uh, chromatograms, magnetic field readings, etc. And third category is simulation. It is machine generated from test models. And it is likely to be reproducible if the model and inputs are preserved. Examples include like climate models, economic models, etc. And the fourth one, we call it derived slash compiled. It was uh, generated from existing data sets and uh, they, they are reproducible, but can be very expensive and time consuming because sometimes, sometimes the large data sets are costly. You need to buy them. Uh, you need to purchase them instead of uh, access to them freely. And <clears throat> those, those, the, the size of those kind of uh, data sets are large. It's a, in, in, in a scale of terabytes or something like that. So, like I said, the, the, the examples include some text and data mining, and a compiled database, and 3D models, etc. So, <clears throat> another category of the types of data is by form. Data can come in many forms. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So here, I listed several form of uh, data types. First of all, is a text. It means field, field or laboratory notes or survey responses, etc. And second is numeric, it's numbers like tables, counts, measurements, something like that. And second, uh, and, and the third one is audio visuals, images and recordings, videos, etc. And the fourth is models or computer codes. It's all like the, 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 the Python code or the C sharp codes that, that, that has been created um, in process of this whole uh, research, et cetera. And then discipline specific, like fits in astronomy or CIF in chemistry. Actually, I 
I have no expertise in both of these disciplines, astronomy or chemistry, but apparently these are some specific file formats that created by some kind of a professional software in the discipline. And then instrument specific, it's uh, some kind of uh, equipment outputs. Actually, um, it, it, it can be, it should be um, separated. It should be uh, separated from the discipline specific because those are instrument specific, not uh, limited in specific disciplines. So those are the types of uh, data by form. And then by stability, this is some, some kind of, uh, th this is a very interesting, I think there's a very interesting category in types of data. So it looks like it's a, uh, how stable is the data? Data can also, data can, can, can be fixed or changing over the course of the project. Perhaps beyond the project's ends, it also can be changed or, or, or fixed or even evolved or something like that. Do the data ever change? Do they grow? Is previously recorded data subject to correction? Will you need to keep track of data versions? Those are some questions um, generally should be asked when, when you want to um, categorize the data by stability. The answers to these questions affect how you organize the data as well as the level of versioning you, uh, 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 as well as the level of version you will need to undertake. Keeping track of a rapidly changing data sets can be a challenge. So it, it is imperative that you begin with a plan to carry you through the entire data management process. So there are three types of data categorized by stability. First of all, it's fixed in data set, which means the data set, the data in the data set never change after being collected or generated. The second is a growing data sets in which new data may be added, but the old data is never changed or deleted. And the third one is a revisable data sets, which means new data may be added and old data may be changed or deleted. So the fourth category of a type of data, we call it by volume. So what does that mean by volume? For example, image data typically requires a lot of storage space. So you want to decide whether to retain, whether to retain all of your images. And if not, how you, how you decide which to discard and where such large data can be housed. Sometimes it's a very frustrating problem or issues that you want answer to during this whole pro research project. So be sure to know you, your archiving organization's capacity for storage and, uh, and backups. To avoid being underprepared is estimate the growth rate of your data. There are some questions that might be uh, needed to consider is that, are you manually collecting and recording data? Are you using observational instruments and computers to collect data? Is your data collection highly iterative? How much data will you accumulate every month or every 90 days? How much data do you anticipate collecting and generating by the end of your project? So <clears throat> these are one the number one points in the general guidance of, of uh, data management in the research. So let's talk about file formats. Uh, the file format you choose for your data is a primary factor in someone else's ability to access it in the future. Those file format will be best to manage, share, and preserve your data. Technology continually changes and all contemporary hardware and software should be expected to become obsolete. So 
consider how your data will be read if the software used to produce it becomes unavailable. Although any file format you choose today may become unreadable in the future, some formats are more likely to be readable than others. That's why we need to talk about the file formats, uh, file format choices in, in, in your research when you plan the data management. So formats likely to be accessible in the future are, first of all, non-appropriatory and, and to op open with documented standards. And, and number three, in common usage by the research community. And number four, using standard character encoding, for example, like ASCII 2 or UTF-8, et cetera. And number five, uncompressed, if the space is permitted. So those are some kind of formats likely to be accessible and, and, and readable and usable in the future. And there are some examples of preferred format choices uh, for images, <laughs> JPEG, JPG 2000, PNG, TIF, F, et cetera. And for the text files like plain text, which is TXT, HTML, XML, PDF, PDA, et cetera. And of course, some uh, formats can be used by the Microsoft uh, Office suite, but sometimes uh, you may want to consider about the software version you are using to produce this uh, text files like uh, sometimes some sometimes we can see some files uh, created by the words in the old version which makes the the, the uh, file format as .doc instead of docx but that's fine that's actually fine because uh, the file doc can be transformed transformed to the docx with uh, some minor losses uh, in the content or something like that. So it is not strongly recommended, but you can still use it. <laughs> and for the audio, um, AIFF or WAVE, sometimes I don't know about uh, MP3 uh, is recommended, but uh, it is also another popular choice. So, and containers um, like uh, .tar, gzip, zip, or I would like to add .rar, but uh, I don't know. RAR is my personal favorite, but I don't know if it is uh, that popular to be used as a, a container or a compressed file format. And databases um, prefer XML or CSV to native binary formats. Talking about the uh, databases or the uh, CSV or some kind of uh, tabular data. <laughs> I would like to say tabular data warrants a special mention because it is so common across disciplines, mostly as Excel spreadsheets. If you do your analysis in Excel, well, you should use save as common command to export your work to .csv format when you're done. Then your, bread, your spreadsheets will be easier to understand and to export if you follow best practices when you set them up, such as number one, don't put more than one table on a worksheet, and number two, include a header row with understandable title for each column. And number three, create charts on new sheets, don't embed them in the worksheet with the data. So for number one, don't put one more, uh, don't put more than one table in the worksheet, which means if you choose to save the tabular data as a .csv uh, instead of a .xlsx, that means you can only save one table in one file, which I personally highly recommend it because CSV, um, first of all, this file, the, the, the size of CSV is much smaller than um, the uh, Excel as, SX. And, and number two, it actually can be read by some other software than Excel itself. For example, uh, Notepad++ or, or something like that. And yeah, the the 
second one to the header row with understandable title for each column. That's is highly another highly recommended item because I um I I ever read some kind of a large data set with a large table file with about 200 variables with the variable name as a VAR name one, VAR name two, which is extremely frustrating when when uh, reading this, this, looking at this whole tabular data table. And about the creative charts, that is another great suggestion because in the field of data visualization, you don't actually want to include those charts into that worksheet you may want to use some kind of a professional data visualization software to create those charts like a Power BI or Tableau or, or something like that. So they're actually, um, yeah. So, so let's talk about, next, let's talk about organizing files. Um, these are some kind of uh, rough guidelines to follow to help manage your data files in case you don't already have your own internal conventions. So when organizing files, the top level, I think we recommend the top level directory um, or folder should include, there are some kind of a basic directory and file naming conventions, first of all, your project title, and then the unique identifier, if you have um, this kind of a unique identifier for the project. And number three, the data. Use some kind of uh, understandable format for the date, um, because sometimes when you go back to look at your old file of this project, some, sometimes you might, be, you might be confused by the data format that you created before. So, and the, the fourth is please separate files or directories. It means like don't dump all the data files into just one folder or one directory, separate them use, using different methods of categorized. So the subdirectory structure should have some um, clear documented naming conventions and separate files or directories could apply, for example, to each run of an experiment, each version of a data set and or each person in the group. So in a separated files or directories, uh, you are recommended to uh, reserve the three letter file extension for the file format, such as .txt, dot PDF, dot CSV, and identify the activity or project in a file name. And then try to identify separate versions of files and data sets using file or directory naming conventions. It can quickly become difficult to identify the correct version of a file. Well, uh, talking about version control, um, there is also another method to use GitHub to um, about version control, but those are only a, can be applied upon some jobs using purely using coding or something like that. And then record all changes to a file, no matter how small. Discard obsolete versions after making backups. And then file renaming. This is some kind of, sometimes it's some, some kind of exhausted and tiring job, but uh, it, is, it is very practical and I personally think requires. So you're highly recommended to make the file naming conventions standards during the whole process and with the, uh, with a, a convention and standard uh, that has been agreed at the very beginning of the research project. So let's talk about some kind of uh, uh, metadata, which means a data document. So first of all, there's a question, why document data? Clear and detailed documentation is essential 
for data to be understood, in, interpreted, and used. Data documentation describes the content, formats, and internal relationships of your data in detail and will enable other researchers to find, use, and properly cite your data. So this is this is why the data need to be documented. And uh, what to what to what to document? First of all, you may need some kind of a research project documentation in which uh, in which the rationale and context for data collection, uh, data collection method, structure and organization of data files, data sources used, which we may um, have we may talk about later in the data citation part, and data validation and quality assurance transformations of data from the sanitized sanitized data through analysis and information on confidentiality access and use conditions those these can be one or multi files uh, in the research project documentation trying to include all of this bullets in the, in it and then another thing i think it's very important is the data set documentation which include variable names and descriptions. Uh, we can call it like the code direction or something like that. An explanation of codes and classification schemes used. And maybe algorithm used to transform data. It could include some computer code and it, uh, it can be included in the separated uh, documentation. And then file format and software. You need to include a version of, of the software you, you use. So begin to document your data at the very beginning of your research project and continue throughout the project. Doing so will make the process much easier. If you have to construct the documentation at the end of the project, the process will be really painful and some important details may be lost or forgotten. So just strongly suggestions, strongly recommended that don't wait to document your data. And um, actually, I just touch base this is that the data documentation is commonly called metadata. It's about data about data. Researchers can document their data according to various metadata standards. Some metadata standards are designed for the purpose of, docu of documenting contents of files, um, others for documenting the technical character characteristics of files, and yet others for expressing relationships between files within a set of data. Um, I have included some links in the notes of uh, actually of uh, every pages. So feel free to click them. I included that data set metadata standard in the notes of this page, in which you can look at some kind of uh, metadata schemes, which is very useful. Um, and these are some general aspects of your data that uh, you should document, regardless of your discipline. At a minimum, store this documentation in a readme.txt file or the equivalent with the data itself. So some general overviews, uh, first of all, title, which refers to name of the data set or research project that produced it. Creator names and addresses of the organizations or people who created the data. Preferred format for personal name is surname for the, like, uh, for example, like Smith, comma, J. And identifiers are the unique number used to identify the data, even if it is just an internal project of reference number, but you, you gotta have this kind of identifier. And the date. Um, key dates associated with the data, including project start and end date, release date, time period, 
covered by the data and other dates associated with the data lifespan, such as maintenance cycle, update scheme, uh, update schedule, preferred format. Preferred format is uh, year dash month dash day or year dot month month dot day dash year dot month dot day for range. Um, and let's be <laughs> let's continue. <laughs> Excuse me. And then the method, and it's like how the data were generated, listing equipment and software use, uh, which should include the model and version numbers and formula, algorithm, al algorithms, um, experimental protocols, and other things one might include in the lab notebook. Excuse me. And then the processing. It's like how the data have been altered or processed for example, how the data will be normalized, something like that. And the source, it's, it, the, the, the source means that citations to data derived from other sources, including details of where the source data is held and how it was accessed. And then funder, organizations or agencies who funded the research. Well, of course, if you don't have a funder for this research, you can just leave it blank or ignore it. These are some other uh, aspects that should be considered than the general overview that we talked about. First of all, it's some kind of a content description which should include the subject, uh, the keywords or phrases describing the subject or content of the data. And the place is like uh, all applicable physical locations. And then the language, all languages used in the data set. Some, sometimes I've seen some of this kind of uh, data set. Sometimes data set, the data sets includes um, several tables in different languages. So you might want to document the languages uh, that used in during this whole research project. And the variable list, uh, which means all variables in the data files were applicable. This is a good uh, supplement to the code to 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 the code directory that we just talked about. It's like um, adding more details doesn't hurt for the users who uh, want to use data set to replicate or 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 to doing some uh, more researchers based on the data sets. And the code list, which is the explanation of codes or abbreviations used in either the file names or the variables in the data file. For example, it's like a, nine, a 999 indicates a missing value in the data or something like that. This is a, sometimes it's very important because the, Sometimes you may you, you may find a lot of like 999 or or uh, an N U L L something like that, which might be confusing for you without this kind of a code list. And then, um, other than the content description, there could be some kind of a technical description in the data documentation. So like, uh, first of all, the file inventory. Uh, all files associated with the project, including extensions. For example, it's a nwpalestr.wrl or stone.mov and, and something like that. And file formats, uh, which refers to the formats of the data, for example, like FITS, SPSS, HTML, JPEG, etc. And the file structure, it's the, it's, it, it is the organization of the file of the data files and layout of the variables where applicable. And then the version, unique data slash time stamp and identifier for each version. And then checksum. Checksum means a, a digest value computed for each file that can be used to detect changes. If a recomputed digest differs from the stored digest, the field the, the, the file must have changed. And then necessary software is the names of any special purpose software packages required to create, view, analyze, or otherwise use the data. And then other than those, it's the access information like 
the rights, um, any no intellectual property rights, stat uh, uh, statutory rights, licenses, or restrictions on use of the data, and the access information. It's uh, where and how your data can be accessed by other researchers. And then let's uh, talk about this uh, persistent identifier. So th th this will be uh, some kind of uh, um, factors that are easy to explain. Is uh, first of all, this uh, persistent, like um, if you want to be able to share or cite your data set, you will want to assign a public persistent unique identifier to it. Um, it's more like the DOI address or some kind of a handle link assigned to um, the articles or the papers, uh, which can be clicked like uh, I listed here is actionable, means you can click on them in a web browser. And by clicking that, you'll be redirected to the page of the data sets from which you can download the, the data set files and all the data documentations, et cetera. And mostly, um, most of the data repository provides such kind of uh, features um, to uh, for, for the users, um, something like that. And this persistent identifiers should be globally unique across the internet, which means uh, duplicate uh, duplicate persistent identifiers is not allowed and can be there. And it should be persistent for at least the life of your data. It means sometimes it's uh, all the time, it should be a long-term persistent identifier, which means any time the user click that link, it should be redirected to the data set page unless you as the researchers decided to remove the data set from the internet, something like that, yeah. And some, I think some useful information about the persistent ident identifiers has been included in the notes of this page. So feel free to uh, look through it and click the link if you want to find more about the persistent identifiers. And then uh, you need to think about the security and the storage of the data. First aspect in this section is data security. Data security is, means um, the protection of data from unauthorized access, use, change, disclosure, and destruction. And to make sure your data is safe, you need to think, first of all, network security, which means keep confidential data off the internet or in some extreme cases, put sensitive materials on computers not connected to the internet. And number two, physical security, which means you may want to restrict access to buildings and rooms where computers or media are kept or only let trusted individuals troubleshoot computer problems because sometimes the, com the, the computers will have some kind of problems and you need some, some people to troubleshooting uh, those kind of uh, technical problems. And number three, computer systems and files. You need to keep virus protection up to date. Don't send confidential data via email or FTP. Like, like I listed here, if, if you must, use encryption. And number three, set passwords on files and computers. And number four, react with skepticism to phone calls and emails that claim to be to be from your institution's IT department. And the second section of security and storage of your data is encryption and compression. Unencrypted data will be more easily read, read, uh, read by you and others in the future, but you may need to encrypt sensitive data. And likewise, uncompressed data will also be easier to read in, uh, to be read in the future, but you may need to compress files to conserve disk space because sometimes uncompressed files 
are much, much more, much, much larger than the compressed files. So there are some kind of uh, suggestions about encryption and compression. First of all, use mainstream encryption tools, for example, PGP, and don't rely on third-party encryption alone. And keep passwords and keys on paper, like uh, you may want to at least keep two copies of the passwords and, and, and keys. And number four, use a mainstream compression tool, for example, zip, gzip, tar, something like that. And number five, limit compression to the third backup copy. And another uh, section of the security and storage of the data is uh, backups and storage. Making regular backups is an integral part of data management. You can backup data to your personal computer, external hard drives, or departmental or university servers. Software that makes backups for you automatically can simplify this process considerably. So you need to backup your data. Um, it's a good practice to have three copies, three copies in at least two locations. For example, regional plus external slash local backups plus external and remote backup. And ge geographically distribute your local and remote copies to reduce risks of calamity at the same location. For example, if you store your data in the same city in a, in a state like North Carolina, which may have one or two hurricanes every year. So if uh, unluckily you got uh, the institution got hit by a hurricane, then this is catastrophic situation happened, right? So it is uh, how, how how it means geographically distribute your local and remote copies to reduce risk of calamity at the same location. And then test your test, you need to test your backup system to be sure that your backup system is working, periodically retrieve your data files and confirm that you can read them. And, and you should do this when you initially set up the system and on a regular schedule thereafter. And then there are some kind of other data preservation considerations. Um, as I listed here, um, beyond any externally imposed requirements, you might want to think about the long-term usefulness of the data. If the data is from an experiment that you anticipate will be repeatable more quickly in expensively and accurately as technology progress, you may want to store it for a relatively brief period. If the data consists of observations made outside the laboratory that can never be repeated, you may wish to store it indefinitely. So based on that, there are some kind of uh, considerations as I listed here is uh, number one, who is responsible for managing and controlling the data? Who controls the data? For example, the PI, um, a student, your lab, your university, your funder. And before you spend a lot of time figuring out how to store the data, to share, to name, etc., you should make sure you have the authority to, to, to do so. And the second question is for what or whom are the data intended? Who's your intended audience for the data? How do you expect they will use the data? The answer to these questions will help inform structuring and distributing the data. And then, like I said before, how long should the data be retained? It's like, is there any requirement that the data be retained? If so, for how long? Three to five years, 10 to 20 years, per or permanently. Not all data need to be retained and some data required to be retained need not to be retained in indefinitely. Have a good understanding of your obligation for data's retention. And then we're going to talk about the sharing and archiving data. So first of all, why share your data? Sometimes it's uh, required by some publishers, for example, Cell, Nature, Science, or something like that. Sometimes it's required by some government funding agencies, for example, NIH, NSF. That's why they have their own DMSP policies for you to create a data management plan to be included in the grant proposals uh, in which 
the the sharing plan should be included as a very important part. And uh, sharing data allows data to be used to answer new questions, and sharing data could makes could 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 make research more open and makes your papers more useful and citable than by other researchers. And there are some kinds kind of considerations when preparing to share your data. First of all, you might want to consider the five formats for long-term access. Like I mentioned before, the five format in which you keep your data is a primary factor in one's ability to use your data in the future. Plan for both hardware and software obsolescence, which means you might want to think about the software that you use to produce the data and the data files. And don't forget the documentation. Document your research and data so others can interpret the data. Begin to document your data at the very beginning of your research project and continue throughout the project. And then ownership and privacy. And make sure that you have considered the implications of sharing data in terms of copyright, IP ownership, and subject confidentiality. What does it mean to share data? Well, sharing data means making your data available so that they can be accessed and used. In addition to the factors that I have talked about uh, in the last slides, and those data can be used, accessed and used either by yourself or by others in the future. And here are three factors to consider when sharing data. First of all, like I, like I said before, it's the format. Data should be shared in a usable format. This may, this may mean sharing raw data instead of prepared data or vice versa, or ensuring that data is saved in common or open file formats. And then completeness. Remember that notes, documentation, and other information about your data are part of your data. To ensure that your shared data is useful, make sure these elements are included. And then uh, location. When choosing a method for sharing your data, consider how other researchers will find and use it. The storage options you use to save your data as you work on it will probably be different than the options you use to share it, especially over the long term. And there are some requirements and about sharing and our archiving and how to meet them is that many research funders, publisher, institutions, and research communities have formal expectations about how data should be shared. So suggestion is read those kind of uh, instructions or menus released by the funders or publishers about sharing data requirements. And there are some kind of uh, some some things to think about is that though it is very likely that you share your data only at the conclusion of a research project, data sharing should be incorporated into your data management practices from the beginning. And data sharing is about showing your work. The many current data sharing requirements focus on data underlying journal um, articles and other scholarly works. You should be prepared to share all of your data. All of it has potential values. And there are limits on how data containing sensitive, sensitive or personally identifying information can be shared. But of course, you should be prepared to share enough information about your work so that others can evaluate, potentially re replicate, and otherwise make use of what you've done. And this actually is a, some, some the, the part of practicing, like uh, finding finding a data repository. It's like you should select a repository or, ar or archive for your data based on the long-term security offered and the ease of discovery and access by colleagues in your field. And these are two common types of a repository to look for. First of all, discipline specific which accepts data in a particular field or of a particular type. And second is a generalist, which accepts the data of 
any type produced within the institution that maintains it. And I have included this link here. Feel free to click it. Um, it is the part of data repository in the research guide of data composed by myself. And it has some kind of uh, a lot of resources about data repository chosen, data repository evaluation, something like that. Feel free to click it afterwards. And then let's talk about the citing data. Citing data is important in order to give the data producer appropriate credits, allow easier and uh, access to the data for repurposing or reuse, and enable readers to verify your results. And there are some citation elements. It's a, 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 a data set should be cited formally in an article's reference list, not just informally in the text. And many data repositories actually and the publishers provide explicit instructions for citing their contents. If no citation information is provided, you can actually, you can still um, construct a, a citation following generally agreed upon guidelines from sources such as um, like a data set metadata schema and something like that. And there are some different different um, categories of the citation elements, like the core elements and some kind of common additional elements, et cetera. So for the core elements in citation is of course the creators, it could, uh, could be individuals, organizations, and the title of the data set, publication year when the data set was released, it may be different from the access date. And the publishers, the data center, archive, or repository, for example, like, like the Dataverse or ICPSR or Open ICPSR or something like that. And the, uh, that uh, the identifier is a unique public identifier, for example, it may have a DOI link or may have a link with the handles or something like that. You should include that into the citation of this data set. And other common additional elements include maybe version of the data set analyzed in the citing paper, an access date when the data was accessed for analysis in the citing paper, and maybe some subset of the data set analyzed, for example, a range of dates or report numbers, a list of variables, etc., and a verifier that the data set or subset accessed by a reader is identical to the one analyzed by the author. For example, a checksum. And the location of the data set on the, on the internet needed if the identifier is not actionable. It's a convertible to a web address. So <laughs> although the core elements are sufficient in the simplest case, citation to the uh, entirety of a static data set. These additional elements that I just talked about may be needed if you wish to cite a dynamic data set or a subset of a large data set. So this is the last part of uh, this data management guidance, copyright and privacy. So this is, um, about the copyright and privacy is so sharing data that you produced or collected yourself. It's like much data is not copyrightable in the United States because facts are not copyrightable. However, a presentation of data such as a chart or table may be. And actually data can be licensed as some data providers supply licenses that limit how the data can be used to protect the privacy of study participants or to guide downstream uses of data. For example, we require attribution or forbidding uh, for profit use or something like that. And like I mentioned here, if you want to promote sharing and unlimited use of your data, you can make your data available under a Creative Commons CC0 declaration to make your wishes explicit. Sometimes we will see uh, this kind of a CC0 or CC-SA-NY or something like that, that kind of a logo um, circle, C in a circle 
it means Creative Commons. And feel free to click the link here to find and learn more about Creative Commons license. And about sharing data that you have collected from other sources is that you may or may not have the right to do so, depending upon whether that data were accessed under a license with terms of use. And most, actually, most of databases to which um, the university library subscribes are licensed and prohibit redistribution of data outside of um, the university. And it is vital to maintain the confidentiality of research subjects, both as an ethical matter and to ensure continuing participation in research. Researchers need to understand and manage tensions between confidentiality requirements and the potential benefits of archiving and publishing the data. So this is uh, some general speaking about the confidentiality and ethical concerns regarding the copyright and, and privacy. So you might need to uh, evaluate uh, the anonymity of your data and consider to what extent your data contains direct or indirect identifiers that could be combined with other public information to identify research participants. And obtain a confidentiality review a benefit of depositing your data with ICPSR is that ICPSR is, is a social science data repository, is that their staff offers a disclosure, disclosure review service to check your data for confidential influence information. And there are, of course, some university regulations that you need to comply with. And there are some kind of a regulation for health research uh, to comply with set forth in the uh, HIPAA Health Insurance Profitability and Accountability Act. And to ethically share confidential data, you may be able to, number one, gain informed consent for data sharing, for example, deposit in a repository or archive, and anonymize, anonymize the data by removing identifying information. Please be aware, however, that any data set that contains enough information to be useful will always present some risk and restrict the use of your data. Like I mentioned before, ICPSR uh, provides a sample. There's uh, links that you can click afterwards. So those are all of the general guidance of uh, data, man data management uh, for a research project. And uh, here are some links for you to click to find out the latest DMS policy released by NIH and uh, the research that should be covered uh, by this DMS policy and the elements of a data management plan uh, based on policy and some kind of a data repository selection. You can find this information on from clicking um, the links there. And for the elements of a data management plan, it's uh, specifically, it should be, uh, it should include number one, data type, like I mentioned before, and number two, related tools, software, and code. And number three, the standards. And number four, data preservation, access, and associated timeline. And number five, access, distribution, or reuse considerations, and last, oversight of data management and sharing. So we we have actually touched base all of the uh, elements that included in, in a DMP and even more. So that's why I said it's highly recommended to consider all of uh, the factors that we talked about before and then compose that data management plan using dmptool.org, which we will touch base to later. And this is, uh, I have included a DM, uh, an NIH DMP tool format in this link here and some examples on data, on, on dmptool.org. So I'm going to click this to show you what this format looks like. So let's um let's share this.
Okay. Okay. Um, um, can you see my screen of uh, that data management and sharing plan clearly? Okay, great. Thank you, Marina. So this is a blank data management uh, and, and share uh, and, and sharing plan released by NIH. So as you can see, uh, elements one, data type, uh, A types and the amount of scientific data expected, and number two, scientific data, and C, metadata, something like that. And element two, element three, element four, element five, with some kind of a guidance and in information in it. And actually, it's it looks like a, a little bit frustrating, but don't worry. In dmptour.org, you will be guided step by step with guidelines, policies, and some kind of a example answer to uh, to to be filled into the different fields of uh, the, the state management and the sharing plan, which I'm going to show show you the example that I have found from dmptour.org the data management plan for NIH. So let's, yeah, okay. Okay, so this is a data management plan, a public data management plan that, that can be found um, on the dmp2.org. As you can see, first of all, the section plan overview, the DMP um, link, the ID link is here. As you can see, right now, all of the official data management plan will be assigned a unique identifier, the DOI link here. And then the research title, the creator, the affiliation, uh, the principal, the principal investigator, which PI and funder, funding opportunity number, and the grant link, etc. And the template this DMP use is NIH generic DMSP 2023. And this is, here is the project abstract, start date, end date, and last modified, and some copyright information. And then <clears throat> the context, the content. Uh, first of all, the data type, it means it refers to the types and amount of scientific data expected to be generated, blah, blah, blah. And uh, you need to describe data in general terms that address the type and amount slash size of the scientific data expected to be collected and used in the project. These parts are the guidelines. The guidelines provided automatically by the mptor.org. You can look at it when you're composing the content of the data management plan. And here is the content created, uh, filled by the author. And likewise, some kind of um, scientific data will be preserved. And here's uh, the created content and then guideline content, guideline content, guideline content, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. This is just an example data management plan created with the dmptour.org. And then next, I am going to show you briefly how to create a data management plan using dmptour.org. And first of all, I want to share with you that this is the link to the dmptour.org, which I think is a pretty direct directly because it's just at dmptour.org. And then uh, with the uh, system integration, you can use your TUNet ID profile to log in directly into dmptour.org. And here's the link to the research guide talking about dmptour.org. And briefly speaking, dmptour.org is a step-by-step, -step, it's a wizard, it's a free open source online application that helps researchers create data management plan. And these plans are now required by many funding agencies as part of the grant proposal submission process. The dmptour.org provides a click-through wizard, a step-by-step -step wizard for creating a DMP. 
that compile com that that complies with funder requirements. It also has direct links to funder websites, help text for answering questions and data management best practices resources. And I have listed two here, research output and PID, which is a, a, a tab that you can key in or input your anticipated research output one by one for you to check later. Um, and and it's more like a feature of project management. And the PID persistent identifier, um, which means that DOI link that we just, that, that I just show you. And it can be downloaded in multiple formats, um, words, doc, DOCX file, PDF file, even CSV file, etc. We'll see. We'll see next. Um, okay. Um, let's. By clicking the the link here. Okay, I'm going to log out first of all, so you can see. So, this is this is the. Um, This is the homepage of dmp.org. And what you need to do is to key in your email address only and then click continue. And you'll be redirected to this one. And what you need to do is just to sign in, click the sign in with institution, SSO, and uh, you'll be redirected to the SSO page of Towson University and uh, you can use your net ID to log in directly. And then this is the dashboard of your data management plan, uh, dmptool.org. And before we talk about the dashboard we and create plan here, we, we can talk about a little bit about other other links here. First of all, funder requirements. If you click this, you'll be directed directly redirect to the pages listed all of the funder requirements here. So by using the uh, search field, you can easily find out the funder requirements of uh, like NIH or let's see an SF. And you can download the files of uh, or click the links to view uh, the official policies. And you can even create a new plan by click this button. And then here's another one, public DMPs. Public DMPs means the DMPs that release or put by the researchers and make it public for you to take as a reference when you want to create the, the DMP tool, the data management plan. And this is the data management plan that I use it as the example that I showed you before, the DMP for NIH generic. And help, these are, this section include a lot of helpful information that I highly recommend you to go through it briefly for you, not just to prepare your data management plan, but also uh, prepare for your research project. Okay, now uh, go to our dashboard. I actually, oh, okay. Well, actually, um, that is a very good question, Gregory. I will check with our IT, um, uh, the, the related team about that because I never heard this kind of issue before. It should be direct to redirect you directly to um, the uh, 
TUSSO login page instead of asking asking you for asking you to create a new account. You 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 shouldn't have to create a new account to use dmptour.org. Um, or maybe just a maybe. Uh, if you may want to try to use the uh, TU VPN or uh, try to log in uh, in the campus environment instead of out of the campus, that that might be the issue. But I will check with the related team about uh, about this issue because um, from my experience, it should it should not happen like like this, but. Uh, I'll check with them. Yeah. Thank you for asking. This is a very valuable question. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, in this dashboard is the plans that you have created. Um, I actually have created a uh, project for marking for practicing. Um, let's click into it. It is actually the same pages when you when you uh, create a new plan. It will ask for your project title and uh, will ask for. Oh, actually, let's click the create plan. So you will see the very initial page of create a new plan. So first of all, uh, it will it will ask for your research project uh, title. It's more like what kind of a research project are you planning? If you click here, this checkbox, this project is, th th this is uh, tell the system that you're just using this plan to practice. It's like mock pro project for testing practice or educational purposes. And then it's the, you can select your primary research organization. By default, it is Townsend University. Or you can click here telling the system that you, you don't have any research organization associated. And then second one, which is the most important part is that you may need to uh, choose your funding organization by input the name or the, the letter stands for it. For example, NIH or an SF, oh, sorry, an SF. So, and after you, ch after you chose your uh, funding organization, there will be different DMP template under different funders. So for NSF, you can choose the template based on the discipline of your research project, et cetera. So generic means it's a generic template. So um, now I'm not going to create another one for mocking. I'm just going to use this mock project that I have created before, like, this is the this is the page that you will see after you click that create plan button. So it will repeat your project title, and you will need to key in some project abstract here, and you may want to specify your research domain by choosing here, and specify the start date and end date of this whole project, and if like the data that you created from this project uh, includes some ethical aspects or something like that, you can check this here and describe the ethical concerns about it. And of course, the funders that you chose before, if you want, you can still check this one. I cannot find my funder in the list. And you can record, uh, take note about the current funding status, is it planned or it's been funded or it's been denied, etc. And funding opportunity number and grant number or URL. And by clicks, by clicking save button, you can save your progress of creating this whole new uh, data management plan. 
And you can actually select the guidance so to help you write your plan. The MP2 can show you guidance from a variety of organization. And you can select up to uh, six organizations to see their guidance. It does means, it, it mean, means what? So let's click this, see the full list. It's like there are a lot of institutions or universities has created their own guidance for dmptour.org. So if you want, you feel free to choose some other guidance created by other institutions. But I personally will just keep the guidance of the MP tour because it will be a little bit, I don't know, complicated when you look at a lot of institutional um, guidance for creating a data management plan. And collaborators, by default, I, as the uh, data science librarian and the data manager and the administrator of dmptour.org, I will be added as the default collaborator um, supporting you with your data management plan. Of course, you can add another or other contrib con contributors um, for this data management plan by clicking this add a contributor here and input the name, email, ORCID, uh, or the uh, ORCID ID and row, something like that. And you can even invite collaborators by inputs in the email address and uh, select the, the permissions uh, here. And by clicking submit, the individual with this email will receive an email <coughs> inviting him to be a collaborator for this data management plan. And now this is the most important part, right plan. So let's expand them all. So, and collapse them all. So, those are the sections that will be included in the data management plan you created. And first of all, the data type on the right, there will be, this is the guidance either by NIH or DMP tool. So I would prefer to use the DMP tool guidance because it is specify what you are going to input into the field here. And here is um, another feature that I like the most. It's, it has some kind of example answer and it has some kind of a DMP tool fill in the blank prompt. So you can just uh, copy paste this and fill in the blanks here to complete the section, et cetera. And here is some guidance and, and, and some descriptions about what you're going to fill in in this section. And likewise, this section includes some subsections and likewise, you can use the DMP tool or NIH guidance to guide you or, or and you can use the example, the fill in in the blank to fill in the sections here, step-by-step. Step. Sometimes there's uh, no DMP tool guidance uh, and you can still use that fill in the blank prompt from basics or the fill in prompts uh, to, to fill in the sections here. So it's all like step-by-step -step wizard that you can use and you can complete it, I think, pretty easily. And here is the research output. So by clicking add a research output, you can input your anticipated research output here. So for example, you may, there, there might be some data set will be um, created as the output of the research search. You can choose the data set and the type of the data set. You can specify the abbreviation here and describe the data set. Is, it, is this data set may contain some sensitive data? or may contain some personally identifiable information, you can check or uncheck the, the, the checkbox here. And you can add a repository here. And this part is a very interesting part. So you can, or you can, you, you may not, to select a subject area or the uh, repository type and enter a, a search term here. I can, for example, Dataverse, we have here. Yep. 
we have a lot of uh, dataverse here. And if I specify, and, and by click this one, you can, you can, you can just uh, select this data repository as the intended repository here, and you can add more. as a part of the research output here. And the metadata standard, like I said, like you can choose the metadata standard scheme schemas by like, uh, if we use Dublin Core here and select it, We selected Dublin Core as our basic metadata standard and something like that. And this is the anticipated release date of this output. Uh, it's like uh, the date, initial access level, license, something like that. And by click save here, you can save this as one of your research outputs. Yeah, the title can be blank. I won't save this. I uh, just want to show you how to use it. And request the feedback. So this is the this is the email that automatically created by the system and sent to my email address, requesting the feedbacks towards the data management plan that you created in the system. So I will receive this email like this one. By clicking this request feedback, this email will be sent to my email address, so schen at daltelson.edu. So this is the finalized part. So you can set up the plan visibility by click here because this is just a mock uh, project for practicing. Uh, I'm not allowed to select it here uh, because this is, but uh, in a of official data, data management plan, you can select the plan visibility. Either it's a private, it's only can, it, it, is it only visible to yourself or to anyone from your organization that tells the university, or you can put it in public to let anybody uh, look at it and use it as an example, something like that. And finally, the download part, you can download this whole data management plan in PDF, HTML, docx, and, and, and something like that. So. I would prefer to download it at docx and you can choose what section you might want to include in this final data management plan. To download it as a, a, a editable format will allow you to adjust and add it to the content and format of this whole um, data management plan. Feel free to try it and practice it. And after you have finalized this whole data management plan, you can either copy paste it and, and copy, copy paste and add it into uh, your grant proposal, um, or you can just include it into a package of files that you will send as the grant proposal to the funders, etc. Okay, um, so this is uh, something that um that I would just mention briefly about the data management elements will be covered uh, regarding the different research data services that we provided. Like uh, for the services of data re repository, we cover the data type and data preservation access and associated timeline access distribution or reduce considerations part of the data management plan. And uh, by providing data analytics and virtualization, we can cover those section of related tools, software and code and oversight of data management and sharing, et cetera. Just want to let you know about that. And here is some screenshots that I um, get from the NIH uh, website. I'm going to skip it because it's just for some uh, reference for you. So, <laughs> Uh, this is some current research data services that I providing, I'm providing uh, as the data science librarian here, data management plan as I just uh, introduced, and uh, the support for the data visualization, data analytics, data repositories, include the data sharing, publishing, and data sets, uh, uh, searching, and something like that. And through the research guide data, there's a link there you can click and consultation in core sessions. 
we uh, I can provide all of this uh, research data services for you and for your research project, even for your student, etc. And again, the data set, the data studio is located on the second floor of our library uh, with five workstations. I installed a lot of data uh, related applications like ArcGIS, SPSS, SAS, R, R Studio, etc. Feel free to use the uh, workstations there for your project or your assignment, something like that. And here is the uh, data life cycle that I always use to be the um, base of all of this research data services. It's like plan, collect, assure, describe, preserve, integrate, um, analyze, and then plan again, just for your um, reference. <clears throat> 